Welcome to Deep Lizard. My name's Chris. In this episode, we're going to learn about dataset normalization. We're going to start by seeing how dataset normalization is carried out in code, and then we'll turn our attention to see just how dataset normalization affects the training process. <laughs> I know, dataset normalization, right? The idea of data normalization is a pretty general concept, and it refers to the act of taking every sample in a data set and transforming the values into a new set of values. And a lot of times, the new values will also encode some type of information relative to the data set itself. So because of the scaling aspect of data normalization, uh, it's sometimes referred to as, or you may hear the word, feature scaling. This term, feature scaling, refers to the fact that when we're normalizing data or when we're normalizing a data set, we're often normalizing various features of that data set to a similar scale. In this case, we're not just thinking of a data set of values, but we're thinking of a data set of samples or elements that have multiple features with associated values. So for example, let's consider that we're working with a data set of people and we have two features, age in years and we have weight in pounds. Now within these two feature sets, we can see that the magnitudes or scale of the values are going to be different. That's because it's typical for an adult person to have a weight that is much greater than their age. This difference in magnitudes between the two feature sets can become problematic if we're comparing outputs or running machine learning algorithms on top of this data set. And so this is one of the reasons that we may want to use data normalization to rescale the features or feature scale, the features of a data set to be on a more similar scale. So let's look at an example normalization task and see the two key facts that we looked at earlier, which is the fact that when we normalize data, we typically are rescaling the data, and the fact that when we normalize data, the data points that are in the new normalized data set typically encode some type of information relative to the data set at large. So suppose that we have a set S of positive numbers. Now, suppose that we choose a random value x from the set S and we ask the following question. Is this value x the largest member of S? Now, think about that for a second and probably what you'll realize is that in this case, the answer is that we don't know. We simply don't have enough information to answer the question. But now, I want to give you one more piece of information. Suppose that we now are told that the set S has been normalized by dividing every value in the set S by the largest value of the set S. So now, given this normalization process, if we choose a value X at random, can we know whether or not this value is indeed the largest member of the new normalized set? The answer to this question is yes. After doing this particular normalization process, we can then choose a member of the set, the new normalized set at random, and we can indeed know whether or not we have the largest value. So I have two things that I want you to do, is just think about this and make sure that you can understand, number one, what is the largest value in the normalized set? And number two, what is the interval or the range of values that, this, that these particular values in the normalized set live on? So there's some interval that every value will be in because we have scaled the data set into this particular interval. So put your answers in the comments. If you're having trouble and you can't figure it out, then go check the article on deepblizzard.com for this blog where I've written out the solution. The reason that we can know the largest value in the normalized set is because this information was encoded 
into the new values in the normalized set. So, and this was relative to the original set. Now, it doesn't really give us much more information than that because the only thing that we can know if we choose a member at random from the normalized set is whether or not we have the maximum. So we don't have any other information than, than, than that. Do we have the maximum? So this brings us to a new and the actual technique that we're going to be using most often in machine learning and in particular with neural network programming is a normalization process known as standardization. So with standardization, we actually encode more information about the data set and we do this re relative to the mean and standard deviation of the original data set. So standardization is a specific type of normalization technique. When we normalize a data set using standardization, we are computing new values for every member of the data set and we are doing this using the mean and standard deviation to compute what is known as a z-score or a standard score. So if you look up online what's the difference between normalization and standardization, you're going to see that there's a lot of kind of conflicting information out there. So the main point to take home or to remember is that normalization is a general process there are many different ways that you can normalize a data set and standardization is a more specific process that is a specific or more specific way of normalization. So whenever we standardize, there's a specific algorithm. There's a specific algorithm that we're using and the algorithm is as follows. To normalize a data set using standardization, we take every value X inside the data set and we transform it to its new corresponding z value using the following formula. We take x and we subtract the mean and then we divide this result by the standard deviation. So whenever we want to normalize a data set using standardization, the hardest part is going to be calculating the mean and standard deviation of our data set. So in deep learning, we're typically dealing with large data sets. And so sometimes it can be cumbersome to know exactly how or to even have the resources to calculate these values. So for some data sets, sometimes the mean and standard deviation are published online. So you can just go grab those values. And then sometimes, and especially when we're working with our own data sets, we have to calculate these values ourselves. But before we do that, there is one thing that I wanted to point out. So I've written here in the blog that it's important to note that when we normalize a data set, we typically group these normalization operations by feature. So this means that the mean and standard deviation values that we calculate are relative to each feature set that's being uh, normalized. So if we are working with images, which is typically the case when we're using neural networks, the features are the RGB color channels. So we normalize each color channel with respect to the mean and standard deviation values calculated across all pixels from every image in the data set with respect to the particular color channel. So that's just something to keep in mind. It's a pain point for some people's understanding whenever you have to have three means, for example, if you're dealing with an RGB image or three standard deviations. But for us, we're gonna be normalizing our fashion in this data set that we've been working with. And these images are grayscale images with only one color channel. So we're only gonna to need to calculate one mean and one standard deviation value. So we'll begin with our imports and then we're going to create a data set. So we'll create a training set here, and this is just the same exact way we've been creating a training set throughout this course. Now, one thing that I wanna point you to down here is the transform parameter of the train set um, data set. So what we have here is a composition of transformations. 
Now up until this point in the course, we've only transformed the what is underneath the hood, a pill image, into a tensor object. And that's what this transforms.2 tensor call does. It takes the pill image and transforms it into a tensor. Now what we're gonna see when we normalize later is that down here, we're going to put our normalize. Uh, our normalize, this is something that PyTorch gives us. It's a way to normalize the tensor data after the pill image has been transferred or transformed into a tensor. So we'll see that in just a minute. Let's keep moving on. So there's really two ways to kind of do this computation. There's what I'm calling the easy way, and then there is a hard way. So the easy way is easy because we can just load the entire data set into memory and then get that data set as a tensor and then just call mean on the data set, on the entire data set, and call the standard deviation. These are built-in methods that come with PyTorch. And so it just takes three lines of code to actually get these two values. The harder way is where we have to iterate over many batches of data because we would have to do it this way if our data set is too large to fit in memory. So we break it down into individual batches and then we have to iterate over it, keeping uh, running totals that we use to perform the, the calculations. And in this way, we have to be more explicit about calculating the standard deviation, for example. But don't worry, we're gonna look closely at the details. So let's start with the easy way and then we'll see how to do it the hard way. So let's start out with the easy way. The first line is just creating a data loader and we pass the train set in and then we want the batch size to be equal to the entire training set length. So we set the batch size equal to the length of the training set and that is gonna give us the entire training set loaded by the data loader and then we're gonna use just one worker to help make that process a little faster. So then here we pass the loader in and we get an iterator and then we get the next value for that and that's our data. So then this data is going to be our images in the first index and it's gonna be our labels in the second index. So we're gonna get at the images in the first index, we're gonna call mean and then we're gonna do the same thing with standard deviation. And this will give us our values. Now, depending on the resources of your machine, this uh, particular way may be possible, it may not be possible. So give it a try and see if it works for you. All right, so here are our values. We can see that the mean is 0 0.286 and the standard deviation is 0 0.353. So, Let's see if we can calculate this the harder way and get the same values. So for the harder way, we're going to, like we did with the easy way, is create our data loader. And this time, instead of having a batch size that's equal to the length of the training set, we're just gonna go with 1,000. And this will allow us to process the data in chunks of 1,000 images. Then the next thing we need is to know what the number of total pixels are inside our, inside our training set. So in order to calculate this, we figure out what's the length of our training set, and then we multiply, that's the number of images, we multiply that by the height, which is 28, and by the width, which is also 28. And that will give us the number of total pixels inside our data set. Okay, so we're ready to calculate the mean. In order to do this, we need to keep a running sum of the, the values, the pixel values for each image. So we're gonna create a variable, total sum, then we're gonna go for each batch in the loader, we're going to add to the total sum the sum of the batch of images. Okay, and that will give us the total sum of all the pixels in the data set. Then we can figure out what the mean is by taking that total sum and dividing by the number of total pixels in the data set. All right, so now we're ready to calculate the harder part, which is the standard deviation. And this is where you need to understand the standard deviation formula to be able to do this. So <laughs> let's do it. The, um, the first thing we're gonna do is keep track of the, what I'm calling the sum of the squared error. 
of the squared error. And so let's just go into the loop and see what this is going to be. So for each batch in the loader, we're going to be summing the squared error. Now the squared error is the difference between the batch of images and the mean value that we calculated before up here. So we get that difference, that's the error, and then we square it by taking it to the power of two, and then we sum it. So the sum of the squared error. So we run through every single batch and we keep track of this running total. And then at the end, we can get the standard deviation by taking the sum of the squared error, dividing it by the number of total pixels, and then square rooting all of that. And that will give us the standard deviation. So let's run the cell and then verify that indeed we're gonna get the same values that we got when we use the simpler PyTorch methods. So here we can see that this harder way also produces the same mean and standard deviation values. So let's see now that we have the values, how we use them to normalize our data. Well, before we actually see how to use them, let's go ahead and just plot the histogram of our values. So we take the data, which is the entire data set, and then we flatten it, and then we just pass that to PyPlot's hist function for the histogram. And then we're also plotting the mean here. So we can see that our values exist on the interval zero to one. And then we can see that all of these down here, this cluster that's down here around zero, those are black values. And then as we get up here close to one, those are white values. And then here we can see this line that we plotted is the mean value. So this is what the distribution of our data looks like. Now, the reason I'm showing you this now is because after we get the normalized data, the distribution will look different and we're gonna see that after we normalize the data. So let's go ahead and normalize our data. So this is the part where we actually use the mean and standard deviation values. Now it's pretty straightforward using PyTorch because they give us a class or a method that we can actually use to do this. So we get a class to work with and then underneath the hood, there is a method that's norm normalizing our data for us. The data will be transformed using the standardization algorithm that we discussed earlier with this mean and standard deviation value that we're passing in. Now, remember, if we're working with RGB values, this would be an array of three means, one for each color channel, and this would be an array of three standard deviations. Again, one for each color channel. So let's create our new train set normal, we're gonna call it, because this one is going to be normalized. All right, so now we have a, a training set that is normalized. Now just to show you what it means or what that has done to the data in terms of its uh, histogram, let's go ahead and calculate the mean and standard deviation values on the new train set normal. So the normalized uh, train set, we're gonna look at it and we're gonna calculate its mean and standard deviation value. So in this case, we've calculated the mean and standard deviation value in the same way as before, and we can see that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And that is the goal or objective of the standardization process. The standard, <laughs> the standard, the standardization process wants to, or its objective is to move the mean to zero and to move the standard deviation to one. And that's what we can see has happened here. So let's just get a visual of that by plotting the histogram. We can see now that our mean value is at zero, which I meant to plot that line. Let me go grab that. So I can just show you the line. I think I put the wrong thing there. Let me rerun that. So here we can see our mean is at zero and then our standard deviation is over here at one. Okay, so now we're finally ready to train using this new normalized training set and see how this process affects the training process. So in order to 
kind of hook in to the system that we've been building over the, the course of this series, we need to create a dictionary of training sets that we that we want to use. So this is you're going to see that this will easily um, the way we've been testing different parameters with the framework that we built. We're going to be able to also use various training sets and see how that affects the process. We'll be able to easily compare and contrast uh, different training sets in our runs. So the first thing that we need to do to add um, training set variability into our run uh, configuration is we need to create a dictionary of training sets. So that's what I've done here. And I've named the first one not normal because that's the first train set that we created and it was not normalized. And then the second one is called normal because uh, train set normal was normalized. And then you could put any number of train sets in this um, dictionary and then we'd be able to um, expose these values inside our runs. So there's two things that we need to do to be able to add these two train sets uh, to our runs. The first thing is in our run configurations, we need to add a train set parameter and then inside there we want to put the values that we want to try. So we want to try the not normal train set and we want to try the normal train set. And then down in our runs or down in our runs loop, all we have to do is instead of putting train set here, which is what we did before, we access the train sets dictionary and we pass in the name of the run or the name of the train set for this particular run that we want to use. So since we're varying on these two particular values, the first time we get first time we do a run, we'll get this value uh, for the train set. And the second time we'll get this value for the train set. So effectively, we're going to be testing doing two runs with all of, the, all of these parameters that we've set and then using these two different train sets. So let's run this code and then see what the results are. All right, so our two runs, both of 20 epochs each, have just finished. Let's go ahead and sort these results and dig in and see exactly what the results are. So we're going to sort the run data by the accuracy column and we're going to do this descending. So we say ascending false. All right, and so here are our highest accuracies across the runs. So the first time, uh, the first uh, epoch that um, the not normal data set shows up is here. So we can see that the accuracy was 91% and pretty much by epoch 16, we were already at 90, well, that same value, a little bit higher uh, for the normalized data. And then we even went a little bit higher. So basically this is kind of tells a story with this particular data set of what data, data normalization uh, gets us. So it, it gets us a higher accuracy faster. So one of the things that you have to pay attention to is that this is going to be the case on average for this data set. So sometimes when you run it, depending on how the weights were initialized, uh, it might not outperform as, as much as we see here, or it might even outperform more than what we see here. So if you run this on average, though, you're going to see that the normalized data set performs better. One thing that's important to note is that it's not always the right thing to do um, it's not always right to normalize your data. So if you're ever um, wondering or unsure of whether or not you should be normalizing, the best rule of thumb is to try it both ways, and normalized and not normalized, and then see what your results are and let the results speak for themselves. Now, the last thing that I want to mention is that um, if you've ever heard of batch norm, then I just wanted to point out that batch norm is the process is the same process as what we've seen here, except not on the training data or the data set. Batch normalization normalizes values in the same way that we've seen here using standardization, but it normalizes activations 
or a given layer inside uh, the network. So, and that's per batch. So we look at a batch of activations for a given layer and we normalize them in basically the same way that we've seen here. Now, if you wanna know more about batch normalization, be sure to check the batch normalization video in the Deep Learning Fundamentals course where that particular process is discussed. And so that's it for normalizing our data sets with PyTorch. If you didn't know, we're actually in Vietnam right now recording this video, and we have another channel called Deep Lizard Vlog where you can learn more about that and connect with us in a new way. And also, if you haven't already, be sure to check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind, where you can get exclusive perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you next time.